right, so let's open up with uh, Luke chapter 2, and uh, we're going to wrap up our three-part series called Joy to the World, and this is the heart of God for us, um, Him to bring joy to us and us to bring joy to the world. So I'm going to read Luke 2, verses 8 through 12. It says, Now therefore, now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. The angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior. Guys, we could just sit on that. We have a Savior. We're saved. We have a home in heaven. We have no fear, no more of death. We have a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign, too. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. So we titled this Joy to the, uh, Joy to the World. And what we're trying to do is paint a picture of the heart of God when it comes to him bringing joy to this world. In week one, the greatest joy that the world could experience was our Savior coming to the world. What I just said a minute ago, I think if we meditate more and more on just salvation, the fact that we have a home in heaven, it, it, it helps with the challenges that we have every day, right? Everybody has mountains. Everybody has challenges. Everybody has issues in their own life and their families. But if I just think about the fact that I have a home in heaven, I'm going to live forever with God. He saved me, and I, I wasn't worthy to be saved, but he chose to save us. And because of that, that should bring a lot of joy. And we talked about that week one, that there are these wells, wells of salvation that we can drink from that brings joy to my heart. And we live in a fallen world. That means we live in a world that has so many challenges every day just when you click on the TV. And if I drink from this well... It changes me. It changes my countenance. It changes my heart. It changes even my, I would say, my constitution, my body, how I walk, everything about me if I drink from this well. So he brought the greatest joy to all of us. Scripture calls it the coming of the Lord, and the early church celebrated this for four weeks, the advent, the perusia. That's the Greek word for the coming of the Lord. And even now, the Lord wants us to celebrate and to prepare for his second coming. And we'll talk about that a little bit at the end of the message. Week two, Pastor Nate talked about not only did Jesus bring joy to the world through his coming, but he also chose to write you inside of his plan so that you would bring joy to people. Amen? This should be a focus in this season. We've talked about this for a couple of weeks. Our focus in this season, and I love to go shopping and hang out and drink the cool Starbucks Christmas coffee and, and all those things, but there should be a focus where I'm thinking outside of myself about somebody else that's normally really not on my plate. Not my normal people, but I should be looking to find someone that needs joy, that needs a touch. Amen? And we did that a couple weeks ago. I forget when it was. We went to the, a nursing home on the fly, and we loved on people, and, you know, we should, we should do that. We should find somebody. We got, what, seven days left? Like seven days till Christmas? I should try to put one or two spots on my calendar this next week. Make myself uncomfortable. Is that okay? Like remove something that's fun from my life to make sure I bring joy to somebody else. Because I promise you, you'll receive a better gift. Not like a, a blessing, but God's good about that. God's good about blessing, but that's not why we do what we do. I mean, just, just the experience of seeing someone's face change. I went to the nursing home. There was one guy. I mean, it just radically hit my heart. This one guy, he says, nobody comes to see me. And he was only 52, and he had a heart attack at 38. And he was just, he was doing bad. He had a stroke. His hands were messed up. And I was telling Paul the other day, we got to go back and see him. So I'm encouraging you in this, these last few days and even after Christmas, leading up to the first of the year, find somebody. You don't have to pray about it. Yeah, just go find somebody. Just go. Just go. We called our nursing home three miles down the street, and they said, sure, come on. 
Come on. So find someone to love on. Amen? That was week two. Week three, I want to talk about this one phrase here that seems to be, it's so elusive for the church. It's, I don't understand. I think sometimes people don't read the Bible. I'm like, how did you come up with that? This is what it says. Glory to God in the highest and on earth, not in heaven, on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. So what is the will of God? It says good on earth. Like there, there's, there's so much inside of the church that's confused about this. What, what is the will of God? It's good. It's right there. But it also says peace. So if, you, if you're not a Jew, you really don't understand this, this concept here. You, you really have to understand that when, when you're studying the Bible, there's a part of the Bible called uh, we're studying words as etymology, which is the study of like Hebrew and Greek and all of that, and that's cool. But there's also a culture when you're getting into etymology, studying words. And the Jews, for the word peace, it means shalom. And to kind of give you a picture up here, if I had a pie, let's say pecan pie. It'd be like pecan pie. Am I supposed to say pecan or pecan? I got rebuked in my house by them two right there, Haley and Emmanuel, that I gave a, a pecan pie to. So we got a pecan pie, and it's got eight pieces. We got a pecan pie, and we got eight pieces in the pie. Each piece of the pie represents something that Jesus died for. Salvation, you get to go to heaven. Healing, deliverance, wholeness in your family, prosperity, all these different pieces all are a product of what he paid for. In, in the Hebrew mind, shalom means you don't have a piece of the pie missing. There, there's not a piece missing in the pie. So when they say shalom, they're saying nothing missing in your life, nothing broken. That's the thought process. So God's saying here on earth, I pay so that you have nothing missing and nothing broken. And if it's something's missing and something's broken, it don't mean that God didn't pay for it. It means I just got to continue to get in line with what he paid for so that it can come into my life. But he says peace first. Then he says goodwill, not to some men, to all men. So wh what is the will of God? It's good. And then I've even heard preachers say that. They got this inverted understanding of good. Like good is good. And we, we've already heard in the world how they'll say good is bad and bad is good. But I'm talking about inside of pulpits I've heard where they're saying this is their definition of good. No, it's, it's, it's in the Word. His goodness is explained in the Word. Are y'all tracking with me? And I'm not, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but what I'm saying is that it's, it's, it's problematic because I can drink of certain rivers and I can have a misunderstanding of God. I can have a misunderstanding of my Savior and I can go through this life not experiencing the joy that he wants me to have. And he paid for that. So this scripture right here is very clear. It'll be up on the screen. It's Romans 8. I think it makes it very clear. Romans 8, 32. He who did not spare his own son. He didn't spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? That's pretty clear, right? So with his son, he's going to give you everything. So we understand that when we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior, he says, I gave you him. Now because I gave you him, I will freely give you everything. And you should know that because you have him inside of your heart. Does that make sense? So 3 John 2. The whole Bible can be summed up in this. Y'all ready? It's a long verse. I pray that you prosper in all things. And be in health, even as your soul prospers. It is the plan of God that you prosper in how many things? In all things. On earth, peace and goodwill toward all men. He says, I want you to prosper in all things. And this is something that the Lord paid for. And he says, I did this. And this brings joy to my heart when you walk in it. Now listen, I want you to lean in on this now. We have a heavenly father. And the way he's demonstrated as good is through you. If the kids are walking in the goodness of their heavenly father, then the world can see that he's a good God. If we are confused, 
the world's definitely going to be confused. Do you see what I'm saying? And it's paramount. It is the joy of the Father. He actually says two verses later, 3 John 4, I have no greater joy than to see that my kids walk in the truth. What truth? What my son paid for so that you prosper in all things. Now this is where it gets tricky for all of us. We prayed. We haven't seen breakthrough. And inside of our mind, we start thinking, what's wrong? Is it the word? Most times we won't think that, but we start thinking something's wrong with us. Something's wrong with our faith. Amen? Every one of us. But listen, if I will just go back to thinking about how good he is when something's not happened yet. God don't make it hard. He tells me, think on these things, Philippians 4, 8. Think on things that has, what he says, has a good report. All right? Psalms 103, it says, bless the Lord. Out of my mouth, if, even when something's not happened, bless the Lord. And he says, don't forget the benefits. And we've talked about this. So by me blessing the Lord when something's not happening and by me saying out of my mouth, Lord, you're good. This has not happened, but this is what your word says. You've forgiven me of all sin. We can all agree with that, right? That's kind of an easy one because we mess up every day, right? So we use that verse all the time, right? Amen? But then it goes on to say that he's healed us of all disease. Then it goes on to say he's crowned you. I don't don't feel no crown. It's played out in favor. He's crowned you with loving kindness and tender mercies. That means when somebody gives you a gift and somebody blesses you and people are speaking really powerful words over your life, that's the crown that God's placed on your head that you can't see. It's not just when you get to heaven. It's even now. He puts things on your life so that you can reign even now. I've crowned you with loving kindness and tender mercies. And he says, I renewed your youth like the eagles. I satisfy you. I satisfy you. Are you all with me? So even when something's not happened, and that's all of our, all of our lives, we've, we've all went through seasons where it seems dry and there's no breakthrough, and God knows that. And I'm going to keep it real with you. There's times where God will lead us the long way, and God's leading us the long way because he wants to give us plan A, but we'll take plan B. That's Deuteronomy 8. I promise you, if you read that, it'll be crystal clear. He says, I led you the long way. So that not only would you believe what I say out of my mouth, but that I could bless you in the end with greater than what you would ask me for. I'm asking God for this. And he says, well, I mean, that is the the straightest point from A to B. But I'm going to take you this way. And I'm going to hook you up so much more. But I'm going to teach you how to trust what comes out of my mouth. You know when Jesus said that when Satan tempted him about the bread? And he says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. That's in Deuteronomy 8. And in that context, he's talking about Israel and how he led Israel. Just like he led Jesus into the wilderness. He led them in a very challenging situation so that he could bring them into a very good land beyond their faith, beyond their understanding, beyond their intellect. That's where he wants to take us. But in that process, sometimes we're like saying, God, you forgot about me. No, 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 you, 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 I mean, you're, you're God, and you're just not making this happen. Does that minister to your heart? And sometimes it's just like, he's not saying, no, 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 it's not that. It, it's not a faith issue. It's a journey issue. I got you on a journey. He's a better steward of our life than we are. He looks over your prayers better than you pray. Like when you pray, it's a monument in heaven. That always resounds to God. Like we forget stuff. He don't. Do you see what I'm saying? And he's such a good steward of your life. So even when it's not working out, bless the Lord at all times. Let praise continually come out of your mouth and remember the benefits and watch what it does. And sometimes it will hasten the season. Sometimes it will. Sometimes it will hasten the season. But even inside of that, what God will bring is God brings clarity. He says, son, if I'm taking you the long way, inside of that attitude of of gratefulness, God brings clarity. And at the same time, God brings rest. Those who have believed, we enter into this place where we can say, I'm going to put my foot on the gas. Let's ride. Amen? 
You guys good? So listen, this will be up on the screen. It's James chapter 1, but God's always bringing something to your life every single day. Every day. I know there's things that we're praying for. There's, you know, we got, we got prayers in our portfolio, right? You got certain things you're praying for, and you're kind of like watching over to, to see, like, when's this going to work? There's things that God's always bringing to your life. James 1, every good gift, every perfect gift is from above. And it says, this is what it does. It's coming down. At all times, God is bringing something into your life. He's bringing a greater measure of him, which is the best gift that we can have, a greater measure of him. And you know, you know what? It's, it's like, it's our operating system. Sometimes our operating system is kind of slow. You ever see that on your, your, your laptop or your phone? And it's like, man, could this thing go any slower? Do you know a lot of times God's actually bringing into our life more of him that's giving us an upgrade with our own operating system? Alan, you should say amen to that because I I know you need a a double portion. (laughs) Front row. That's what you get on the front row. But on the flip side of that, what that does is that empowers us to do things faster, more efficient, different realms of excellence, gives us greater ideas. So even in this season, this is one of the things that I believe that God's doing, something I prayed of your life with breakthrough just now when it comes to his voice and comes to his presence. You know, when it comes to the voice of God, we think that God only speaks when we understand. I'm going to teach on this. We think we hear when we understand. Like God speaks English or Bimba or Spanish. Sometimes we fail to understand it's more important to recognize the person in the room than even our comprehension. So when I pray for us, even in the ministry moment, that not only will we hear, but we will experience his presence in greater realms because there's things that God can do with his presence that moves us at a faster pace, even if God could speak to us in our native tongue, we would still go slower. Does that make sense? He does more with downloading and and giving us a faster upgrade. So I believe that this is one of the things that God's doing inside of this season for all of us, that there's a coming of the Lord. But listen to me for a minute. I'm just going to minister to you, and then I'm going to wrap up with, uh, I believe, uh, um, something on his heart. You know, we're believing God for revival in this region. We're believing there's a bunch of churches and pastors. We're one of them that's come together with a bunch of churches that are believing for a million disciples. And that's incredible. And we're, we're asking God for revival, but are we really prepared? Are we really prepared? How prepared is my schedule if God was to show up in this room tonight and we couldn't leave? How undone would we be if it didn't fit inside of what we thought? Today, what do y'all got to do tomorrow, the next day? Like true revival is not just like some preacher coming in just preaching. That's, that's, that's not true revival. Revival is when God steps inside of the room and everybody's kind of messed up. And you can just set the mic down. And God does more in those moments than we could worship, pray, preach, all those things. This is what a city needs God's more focused on cities than he is a local body, even though God's still focused on a a local body. Are y'all tracking with me? I want you to hear me because I'm kind of, I'm being a little bit elusive here um, because I I know my train of thought. So I feel like God wants to give us something in this season to help us with preparation. Like what if God was saying, I want to pour out new wine, but your wine skin can't contain what I want to give you. I want to pour out my presence in a way where you've never experienced this, nor have you saw this, but your wine skin would rip. See what I'm saying? We're asking, but what is the preparation? And then God's not going to give us that because it talks about this in Scripture. I'm not going to pour out that much wine and it rip and be ruined. I'm not going to trust if there's not the preparation. Y'all tracking with me? So one of the things that God always does is God always speaks over and over again to us about something he wants to do. 
It says, surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals a secret to his servants, the prophets. Amos 3.8. Back up to all the way to verse 3. It says, can two walk together unless we're in agreement? And then God says, are we in alignment? Are we in agreement? Because I want to release something into your life. Pour something into your life. Merry Christmas. Is this too heavy? You guys okay? So one of the greatest gifts that God can give us is his faith. It's very interesting. You know, when we worship the Lord, we think sometimes that God moves in worship. You know that's not true? That's not true. It doesn't say that in the Bible. The only way God moves is by faith. My worship is to adore him, not to get him to move. There's a huge difference. We say sometimes, man, the worship was awesome. God was moving. No, God actually wasn't moving because we're actually worshiping him. Faith is actually what makes God move. There's a difference. I'm supposed to pour out my heart to him in worship because what I worship, I become. What I behold, I become. That's paramount. But when it comes to a kingdom that we live inside of, a kingdom that has laws, a kingdom where God himself has submitted himself to his own laws. He says, in my kingdom, I move by the principle of faith. It's the way Jesus operated when he walked on the earth. This is what it says in Hebrews 11. It says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. That's a heavy word. Let me say it another way. It's an absolute. It's an absolute in the kingdom. So if God says this, without faith, you can't please me then I need to understand that I can, I can uh, take the measure of faith that God's given me in Romans 12, and I can begin to nurture it. But there's times where God does this. If you guys can look at me for a minute, God will just come on your life. Excuse me, I stepped on your toe. And God will put his hands on you, and it's like God superimposes himself and gives you a gift where your faith has become accelerated. This is what I believe that God wants to gift us with. This is one of the things, I want to say one of the things that God is actually bringing down into your life. I'm going to use another word for a minute. It is the persuasion of God. Listen to me, church. It's the persuasion. It's the conviction of God. What is the conviction of the Father? Because when we think faith, we're thinking that it's almost like a business transaction so that I can receive from God. That's not wrong, but it's incomplete. There's something way much more deeper when it comes to faith. It's the persuasion of him. It's his conviction. It's what is pressing on his heart to connect heaven to earth in the moment. It can be someone lost. It can be someone sick. It can be all these things. But it can even be God giving you a special key. When he talked about building his church in Matthew 16, I will give you the keys to the kingdom. And it says you're going to be able to lock things up and unlock things. And the gift of faith can be a special key. I mean, let's be very granular here. It could be a, a key when it just deals with something going on in the mind. Challenges with the mind and God showing you as he puts his hands on you and says, I'm going to trust you with this key. Are y'all tracking with me? What are you going to do with it? What are you doing right now? Like, where's my heart right now? Where's my heart leaning in right now? So, like, give it to me. Don't just give me the one. Give me five. Give me ten. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Y'all remember the crazy story in the Old Testament when the prophet tells the guy to hit the ground with the arrows? And then he rebukes him. He says, you didn't hit the ground enough. I'm like, you don't never know it's a test till you're in the test. What if this is a test right now and God's saying, I want to give you, but how much are you leaning in so that I can give you more? Like, are you going to be satisfied with just your devotional and your prayer life? Or are you going to lean in to him and see how many times you hit the ground or ask him for more keys than you're supposed to get so that he can bring that type of persuasion or conviction inside of your heart. His measure. Y'all 
Y'all hard tonight. You guys okay? So, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for what you're doing in this moment. It's a holy moment right now, guys. It's a holy moment. You should take a moment. Just close your eyes. So, Lord, I thank you for each person in the room. Christmas has... um become something that's not inside of your plan. I pray that you help us in this season understand the the bigger picture, how you see the world, how you see us, how you see people around us, how our life can be so cluttered and so busy. I pray, Lord, that you help us to declutter. Declutter our life, Lord, so that we can fill our life with your heart. Like, what is too aggressive? What is too aggressive? I I don't think that we can ever be too aggressive. I don't think that we can ever be too crazy for the Lord. I don't think that we can ever fill ourselves or fill even what God wants us to do. I think sometimes we, we back up and God wants to give us so much more. So even in this moment, I'm just asking God, speak to our hearts. Speak to our hearts about your persuasion, about your faith, about your conviction. Just with your eyes closed for a minute, I just think that God wants to give you a picture, give you a word. Um, Don't discount it. Don't discredit it. It's usually the first thing that comes, and God don't have to make sense. He's God. And just hold it for a second. So we just bless what you're doing in the room right now, Lord. We bless what you're doing in the room right now. We just thank you for downloading, downloading your heart right now. So we thank you, Lord. We thank you. So even in this season, there's going to be things coming down to you in your dreams, in your prayer life, um, where God's going to be speaking to you along these lines, his faith, his persuasion, his conviction. And I believe the Lord has given you an invitation to lean in more and more. I got the color blue, and real quick, just like that, a blink of an eye, it's like I saw the clouds, the heavens, and just like that, another thought came, and your assignment is to reveal the nature of God. So that means God's going to give me greater faith to reveal him, which is probably the most daunting thing that you could do that quick. Just from the color blue. Do you hear what I'm saying? So if you've got a color, a word, or something like that, you can lean in, and God will give you more, but it's going to tend more toward his faith, his persuasion, his conviction. And, 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 and let me say it this way. What I just use as an illustration with myself God wants to give you something that seems like you can't do it. Otherwise, it's not God. It's got to be bigger, and it's got to scare you a little bit, or that's probably not the voice of the Lord. Okay? So, Lord, I thank you for coming down, even in the room now, descending upon your people and resting upon your people, even inside of this season, this season of Advent, this season of the coming of the Lord, even as we lead up to next Monday, we celebrate you, Lord. We thank you for your faith. We thank you, Lord, for your conviction and persuasion in this season. And I bless each and every person in the room. In Jesus' name, amen.